plays in Resident Evil. Uh, what it, what's interesting about these is that they're so narrow and the tank controls so hard to work with that if there's a zombie at the end of the hallway coming at you, the zombies in that game are built to be difficult to kill. And as the zombie approaches, your space gets narrower and narrower. In the Metroid Prime series, Samus deals with narrow spaces a lot when she gets into the Morph Hall. Now, she has limited battle ability here with bomb power up. So what is interesting are situations where, <coughs> um, like in Metroid Prime 3 when Ridley attacks, she's in this little vent and you're being attacked by one of the major bosses of the game inside of a small little corridor. Now, I love zombies. I, and not just because I think zombies fiction is fun, I also think that they're a really useful tool. I like to call them alternative architecture at times. Mm. And what's interesting about zombies is that you can use them to close people into a place. Uh, another game, uh, game design theorist, Matthew Weiss from Gambit Game Labs, calls this the shrinking fortress theory of zombie fiction. The idea of, say for example, Night of the Living Dead, where there's a farmhouse, and at the beginning of the movie, the farmhouse, the humans have most uh, control of most of the farmhouse. As the movie progresses, they start to lose rooms to the zombies. That's what's uh, interesting about uh, using zombies, for example, uh, or any other type of enemy that can actually rush and hurt the player into tighter and tighter quarters. <laughs> Moving on to intimate space, uh, intimate space is neither confining nor overly large. Uh, spaces are reachable to the player avatar within the scope of its abilities. This is often a safe space. This is the space that you see in a lot of hub worlds. Uh, so, for example, uh, and I'll go back, to Peach's Castle in Super Mario 64. I saw some people were still taking them, so I'll just get back here. Um, Spaces like that. Spaces where you as the player are often in command. And this is actually the kind of space that you can um, contrast narrow and the, the next space we're about to discuss with. You know, these kind of spaces will actually make the player feel more empowered. And a lot of these types of spaces are what you see in, for example, that game company's games. When they're trying to create, you know, feelings of happiness or soaring or things like that. So again, Peach's Castle, Mario can jump up to most of these ledges uh, with relative ease. There's a couple of uh, ledges later on that are actual tests, but still within the character's default abilities. Um, Batman Arkham City and Arkham Asylum are good examples of games that use this to actually put the player in control. Um, Rocksteady, when they were uh, putting together Arkham Asylum, said that they did not want this to be a stealth game because stealth implies that your avatar is weaker than the enemy. This is a predator game. So most of the spaces in the game are, you know, Batman, when he goes into them, he has control of them. And if you lose, it's probably because you lost control of the space. The third type is a really scary type of space called prospect space. It's wide open space where you're open to attack. This, uh, if we're using the caveman analogy, um, this is the open plain where the saber-toothed tigers live. Here, signified by a giant mean looking dragon. So, Prospect spaces are often used to create boss rooms. Um, you know, for here, uh, for example, here in Mega Man Ten, um, the boss room is just a giant open space where you're fighting concrete man. Uh, prospect spaces are also used in fighting games, which are not really designed level spaces, except for being an arena for the players to fight upon. It's wide open, there's really no tip, uh, tricks to 
to moving around it. It's just you and Scorpio. So how do we get these to start working together? Well, uh, one way to do this, uh, especially uh, contrasting the prospect space, is to use what's called a refuge. Uh, a refuge is a covered space where people can hide and evaluate potential threats. So, refuge spaces, they're small, but they're intimate enough that they're not going to really challenge you. And they're often not spaces where the bad guys are going to encroach upon things. Uh, so you can use prospect and refuge in a sequence. When you alternate prospects and refuge, they can create an intense, uh, intense spatial progression. Um, this actually leads to what's called a secondary refuge, which is the refuge that you can see from your current refuge. So if I'm agoraphobic, uh, you know, having the fear of wide open spaces, and I'm in here, this isn't too bad. This is a small-ish room, um, but I'm terrified of the, of the hallway outside because it's so huge. I probably think, okay, well, if I want to feel safe again, I've got to get to that room next door. So I'm going to look out the door, try to evaluate where my threats are, and then run to the uh, next door. That's the secondary refuge. Um, prospects and Refuge appear in architecture, the IT University of Copenhagen's atrium. It's a large prospect space with refuge-like classrooms uh, hanging overhead. So these little uh, <coughs> refuges kind of hang over this large atrium space, and these are private classrooms. So you can look outside. You're not really in any danger because you're, you're in a building, but you can look outside and watch as people kind of go by in the public circulation space. And that's what a lot of these prospect spaces are in real world buildings. They're circulation spaces. Whereas the refuges, what would be conceived as refuges, are uh, the destinations. The architecture of Lake Corbusier is often seen as uh, prospect heavy. Um, it's my belief that he would be an awesome designer of FPS levels, especially multiplayer ones. And here's why. Uh, he, this is his building, Villa Savoie, and the core mechanic of it, if you will, um, the philosophical belief he was trying to build into it was uh, rising. He felt that man was above nature, and you would, uh, as you climbed the ramps in the middle of this building, you would get to more and more advantageous spaces. So this is a view from the roof garden. You can see how you can watch people as they move through these large open air areas on the floors below you. So uh, that coupled with large ribbon windows and uh, spatial, you know, just the way the space is divided up, create a very prospect heavy space. And again, would probably make an excellent FPS map. You see spaces like this in games like Halo Reach, um, where sometimes if you are the type of player who likes to play with a sniper rifle, um, a lot of the game can be trying to rise above the players and gain control of the prospect. Frank Lloyd Wright, on the other hand, does a lot of refuge-based architecture. He mandated that drawings of his buildings that came out of his office would have to have trees around them because he felt that, and that the natural setting enveloped the building nicely and made, made the client feel like, oh, my, my house is going to be really safe. Uh, same thing with, this is falling water. A lot of his uh, buildings had the hearth in the middle, the fireplace, because that was at the time the center of the family. Uh, this was before television. So he would put that at the middle of the house so everything was around it, and then he might actually you know, uh, indent that space into the floor a little bit. Same thing <coughs> here, this is more drawings of stuff you'd find in Frank Lloyd Wright houses. You know, you see that 
the living space is sunken into the ground. You see that the dining and sitting space is sunken into 